What is the future of the faith and work movement? And who will be the leaders of the next generation for the faith and work movement? Because these are such important questions, I think that this next presentation may be one of the most important ones of our day today. If we want our movement to not simply be a uh, fad, but if we want it to be a trend, if we want the momentum to carry forward, this is a question we have to take seriously. So to help us understand how to engage with the next generation, I'd like to give you two pictures. One is a picture of the student leaders who ran the Believers in Business Conference last year. This is our national annual Christian MBA conference. I'm going to leave it up so that you can take a look at them as I paint the second picture, which is we're going to role play. I'm going to be an MBA student, and you're going to be a senior leader. And together, we're going to have a conversation about mentoring. I chose mentoring because I think it'll be a good window into the next generation. And I know that many of you and your organizations are engaged in mentoring right now or are considering doing it. So perhaps there'll be some good tips for you in this. InterVarsity has also noticed that there are many in this next generation of students that really appreciate mentors. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. So please join me in a coffee shop as we have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about mentoring. Well, thanks for joining me here. I know you've got a busy schedule, so I really appreciate that you took time to meet with me. I've also been reflecting on the question that you gave me. What is my generation looking for in mentors? I actually met with some of my friends to discuss it. And if you don't mind, I took a few notes in my phone so that I could capture what we were discussing. Well, let me talk about me first and um, the thing that I'm most interested in <laughs> with mentoring. Um, the thing I need most from a mentor is helping me figure out my purpose in life. My friends and I like to think of this as our storyline or our narrative. It's something that um, kind of comes out of our childhood experiences, um, but it really frames how we view all of life. As a matter of fact, last week I just had an MBA course, and in that course we were being taught how the brain operates and takes all the data of our experiences and puts it into some sort of story or narrative. Uh, let me give you an example, too. A friend of mine, Joshua, um, really grew up with sort of a toxic narrative. His family moved a lot of times when he was growing up, so he, he always felt like an outsider. He would set himself up to be an outsider later on, and he didn't have to be. It really became hurtful to himself and other people in his life. So God put a mentor in his life that helped him recognize that and reformat his experiences of his childhood into a narrative that would help him flourish and help him uh, help others. So my, the truth is my generation really appreciates story and narrative. That's why we like movies so much. And it's really more so than what we sometimes hear your generation talking about actually with principles or virtues or values. For us, it's more narratives and story. Now, to be honest with you, not all my uh, classmates and friends resonate with this idea of narrative, but I do, and I'm still trying to figure out my purpose in life, and I need a few things from you to help me do it. Probably the biggest thing I need for, from you is for you to truly listen. Um, let me give you a counterexample that happened this last summer on my internship. A senior leader came up to me in the company and put his arm around me and said, I see a lot of leadership potential in you. I want to mentor you. So I, I was quite honored by that. So we started meeting together. And what actually happened was he talked about 90% of the time and listened about 10% of the time. After a while, I got the sense that I was kind of like a project for him. And what he really wanted to do was have me sit at his feet and listen to his war stories or his complaints about his boss, and then become kind of a mini-me version of him. 
Um, that didn't work out too well. Now, don't get me wrong. I do want to hear about your stories and your journey and your life. As a matter of fact, my generation really values authenticity. And the truth is, if I'm going to share my life with you, I need to know that you're willing to be vulnerable with me as well. I want to hear about not just your victories and your wins, but also about your setbacks and your failures and how you handle those things. Are you willing to share your life with me in that way? I'm not looking for you to have all the answers. I think nobody does, really. It seems like sometimes leaders of your generation will feel like to every question or problem, you've got to have an answer. But sometimes what we really need is just for you to sit with us and listen. Well, actually, for me, there's probably more to it than that. Sometimes I can be pretty self-focused and make myself the main character of my story, kind of center of the universe kind of stuff. In those instances, I need you to help me re-standard myself and make the main framework of my life God's big story, not just my personal story. So one of the reasons why it can be so easy to become self-focused is there's so much pressure to be successful. We have so many examples of our peers who've been successful early on. And it leads to a lot of anxiety. One of my friends, when we were discussing this, told me about a great article in the Huffington Post that I'd like to show you a copy of here. So in this picture, you can see that we all have these great expectations but our, the reality of our careers and our lives right now in my generation is kind of like this brown grass at the bottom. We've grown up being told that we can do anything and we can reach the moon. And so we expect to have global careers uh, with global travel and global income. That's what's represented by the dancing unicorn that's vomiting out a rainbow at the top of that. It, <laughs> we know it's unrealistic. But we're frustrated sometimes because we feel like we've been cheated out of that future that we thought we'd have. And if I scroll down a little bit, you can see how technology actually makes it worse. We end up taking a look at what we think our peers are doing. That is the crafted images that they put out on Facebook of just the good things or the things that they put spin on. And then we look at the brown grass we're standing on and we feel like we're well, it's depressing, is what we feel like. So what we really need is help calibrating our expectations. And we also need to know, because of this pressure for success, that we don't have to have pressure in our relationship with you as a mentee. That we're not just a project that will help you achieve your goal of, quote unquote, leaving a legacy, but that you really care about us as a child of God. If I were to not go into business, or if I felt like God wanted me to spend my time not in the faith and work movement, would you drop our relationship? One thing about my generation is that dependability in relationships has not been there. A lot of us have grown up with fractured families. The definition of friendship has really changed over time. And significant other relationships are just confusing. Many of us join careers, too, that cause us to hop from city to city or job to job. Yet at the same time, we really long for deep relationship and community. So one of my questions for you is, would you invite me into your community, your community of peers? I was reading the other day about this thing called the Clapham Circle, where there was a group of people that got together and lived in community and fought against slavery together. That is very attractive to me. I'd like to be part of a Clapham circle. I know I'm called to make some sort of difference in the world. I'm learning that I can't do it on my own, that I need others to do it with. And so I'm looking for some sort of community. Community in my generation is like our lifeblood. It helps us stay on track spiritually, and it helps us achieve our purpose and mission in life. Now, there's one nuance I need to, to make when I talk about community. 
And I don't want to offend you or anything, but I think it might be just helpful if I just kind of say it. Sometimes when my friends and I have gone to events that have been part of organizations you're with, um, we've noticed the lack of women or people of color in the room, and it just feels odd to us. You, you see, we've grown up in school and even in our MBA program, in churches and in campus ministries that have taught us the value of diversity and that the kingdom of God is a diverse place. So we really value everybody's voice and it, it just feels kind of weird for us. It's not a deal breaker and we're not asking people to be different than who you actually are, but it's just something you should be aware of. My generation really expects to have a voice. We have grown up with talk shows, reality shows, the internet where instantly you can let other people know what you're thinking. So if you want us to be part of your organizations, then give us a voice. And if I can humbly suggest, it may be that the way you communicate, the way decisions are made, and even some of what your mission is, we need to have a voice in or it may need to change. Well, um, thanks for listening. I really appreciate the time that you've taken, and I'd love to hear what you think about what I've said. Well, I'm not done yet. Sorry, that's just the end of the role play. We're not, I'm not done yet. <laughs> so, so a couple quick observations or reflections, maybe questions for us to consider. So. Mentoring is only one strategy that we can use to engage the next generation. So the first quest question is, what are some of the other ways that we can invite full participation into the movement? Now, some in the next generation are very entrepreneurial. So they may have a little interest in joining what's already existing, but they'll want to start their own things. So how can we encourage entre entrepreneurial endeavors? I'm quite excited, for instance, for some of my former students who went on to start Praxis, which is a social venture accelerator. Check, it out, check out their website, it's very exciting. Another thing that I think we should consider is what changes we need to make in ourselves and in our organizations. Implied in part of the role play is that cultural competency is very significant. And you may have noticed the gender and cultural diversity in the planning team for last year's Believers in Business Conference. That's something I continue to need to learn and I think we're all called to, given who the future leaders coming through the pipeline are, who will be of our churches, our cultural institutions, and the faith and work movement. And finally, it goes without saying that we should be wondering what types of mentoring programs we should be developing. My one plea for you there is that you carefully think about how you screen and train your mentors before you release them to students. So as a final thought, um, and what I think could be the zinger of the presentation, is I'd like to share with you an observation about the current MBA students that are in the programs that we have now across the US. They're very committed, they're very purposeful. I began seeing a change after the financial crisis in how much students were connecting their mission in life with their career. And I think we may have a special opportunity, window of opportunity with this group. Here's why. If you think back to when this current MBA students were in junior high or high school, in their current events classes, they were studying Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, Arthur Anderson. On their first job after college, subprime head. During the time in which their forma the formation of their worldview occurs, they have personally witnessed and experienced the impact of business on the global community, and so they're highly sensitized to that. I wonder what would happen if we have a decade without global economic crises and ethical issues to the next following generation of business school students. Certainly now is the time to invest in this generation, and may the Lord help us do so.
Mark, thank you so much. I kept writing questions down, and then you would answer the question, and I had to go down to another question. I'm wondering, uh, you know, great coaches know how to connect people. They get the team playing together. And I wonder if you could just share with us a mentoring relationship that's working. Maybe one that you didn't, maybe you didn't think it would work so well, but it's working. Maybe it's one you thought would work well. But, but describe in just, a, in just a brief moment, what are some of the characteristics that are making that relationship work? Well, a few of them I've already listed. So the mentor is someone who's willing to listen, ask good questions. They're on their own journey in Christ, and they're willing to share that and be vulnerable about it. Um, also, they're available. This dependability piece is an important piece. I, I polled uh, students I've mentored, and that's where that idea came from. Um, they need to know that you're going to be present for them when they need you, not just that they're a project that you, know, you meet with every so often. So I think those are some of the key things. I think it's good for mentors to be in community with other mentors too, to be comparing notes. Um, so I think that helps the relationship as well.